In this video, I'm going to sketch out in very general terms William Hayes' deformity and essay. For most of the information, I must credit Kathleen James Cavan of the University of Saskatchewan, who has done a great deal to recover information about William Hay and his essay. The edition I'm working with came out in 2004 as part of the English Literary Series published by the University of Victoria in British Columbia. Deformity in Essay arguably is the first disability memoir, and it was published in 1754 by a hunchback member of the British Parliament. It was published within the last year of Hay's life, for he died in 1755 at the age of 60. In this essay, Hay is responding to a number of texts. Two very important ones are Shakespeare's Richard III and Francis Bacon's Of Deformity. Note that Bacon inserts the preposition of prior to the word deformity in his title. For though, as though Bacon were writing objectively about a topic that, he, that had nothing to do with him. For Bacon, deformity is an abstract topic about which one opines, throwing out a series of generalizations. By removing the preposition of from his title, Hay appears to be making a statement. By making the title simply deformity, deformity becomes a subject, a subject about which he, as the subjective first person voice of the essay, the I, has a number of specific points to make. At the minimum, removing the preposition personalizes the topic. It allows Hay to own it as something about which he has expertise. He was born in 1695 in Sussex and was orphaned by the age of five. He managed to matriculate at Christchurch at Oxford University in 1712, but he left in 1715 without having taken a degree. He then took up the study of law in Middle Temple in London. Hay describes himself as being a hunchback who is barely five feet tall. No images are extant of Hay, so we can only imagine what he looked like. On top of his orthopedic problems, he contracted smallpox sometime between 1715 and 1718, and this disease both disfigured him and impaired his vision. Still, he managed to tour England and Scotland in 1718, and France, Germany, and Holland in 1720. He returned to Sussex after his travels abroad, where he became a country magistrate. In 1731, he married Elizabeth Pelham. His marriage produced five children, but none of these children produced descendants. His wife's father was related to the Duke of Newcastle. Hay went into politics, and as a Whig politician, with the Duke of Newcastle's help, he managed to win a seat to Parliament in a by-election in January 1734, representing Seaford. Hay's parliamentary career turned out to be long and busy. In Parliament, he worked tirelessly on behalf of the poor. Despite his bad eyesight, he also wrote several pamphlets suggesting ways to improve the system of aiding the poor. In addition to his pamphlets addressing social issues, he also published poetry and essays. However, today he is only remembered for deformity and essay. It was republished in several editions in his lifetime and after his death a year after his publication, four more times, in a text entitled Fugitive Pieces on Various Subjects. The last time before the 21st century that it appeared in print was 1794. It was not available again in print until 2004, thanks to the scholarship and editorial work of Kathleen James Cavan. Deformity in Essay combines the genres of memoir, literary, and cultural critique, and medical testimony. It gives vivid glimpse into what life was like for a disabled person on the streets of London in the 18th century. One learns that deformed, defective, and disfigured people were objects of ridicule. Simon Dickey writes that, quote, blind men, cripples, and amputees were standing jokes in mid-18th century, almost automatic figures of fun. How did Hay respond to this ridicule, at least in his writing? Leonard Davis implies that there lurks an abject and servile tone in Hay's essay. Davis criticizes it for, quote, reiterating, although humanizing and questioning, questioning to a degree, stereotypes about people with disabilities." End quote. However, James Cavan responds that the essay is far bolder than Davis' criticism suggests. She writes that, quote, William Hay contests his liminal position in a culture that valued a charming body and a lovely mind, end quote. Hay redefines, quote, his alterity as a fortification of an enlightened middle-class culture, end quote. She further maintains that Hay, quote, insists throughout on the social virtues of the marked deformed body, thereby resisting the devaluation of this second term, deformed body, that plagues the binary distinction of ability and disability." End quote. In this course, we will read Hay's essay, 
as a very early example of the new emerging paradigm of disability, the social constructionist model. Just as theorists such as Judith Butler have maintained that sex is biological while gender is culturally constructed, practitioners of disability studies distinguish between disability and impairment. A disability is not the same as an impairment, for a disability is situated within the larger social context, while impairment is a biological condition. Leonard Davis, in another piece, describes this model thus. Disability is, quote, located in the observer, not the observed, and is therefore more about the viewer than about the person using the cane or the wheelchair. An impairment, uh, Davis continues, is a physical fact, but a disability is a social construction. For example, lack of mobility is an impairment, but an environment without ramps turns that impairment into a disability. Put simply, the social constructionist model understands disability as a conceptual space in which people project one or more meanings onto people with impairments. It is also a conceptual space in which people develop identities in light of the impairments they themselves have. In other words, while in the social constructionist model, impairment in and of itself is understood to carry no intrinsic meaning, meanings invariably become attached to impairment and the people who have them, both by the non-disabled and by people who live with impairments. There may be no escaping from the imposition of meaning, but with the social constructionist model, we begin to become aware of the process of meaning making and to try to explain from where these meanings come. If we follow and accept James Kevin's argument, Hay begins to formulate an affirmative disability consciousness and identity as he describes his life as an object of ridicule on account of his misshapen bodily form. It is in this text that we see, perhaps for the first time, disability being presented as a privileged or positive category. James Cavan observes that Hay does not adopt a tragic or despairing view of his impairments. On the contrary, she notes that Hay points out the beneficial aspects of deformity and how these benefits have helped him to develop as a human being. Most importantly, Hay articulates a perception of his own identity, that is, a sense of who he is, in terms of his deformities, and this is the a positive, proud identity.